Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's morning here in the southern United States. This is Dr. Ken Berry. I'm a family physician with 20 years of clinical experience. And today I want to go over some simple concepts about a proper human diet and why I believe it should be the proper human diet for all of us, regardless of, of genetics, regardless of uh, the current place we live in the world, regardless of our age. I think that more and more research is emerging showing that a low carbohydrate diet is without doubt the healthiest diet for optimizing human health. Now, I want to just go through some simple concepts with you uh, while I'm going through these. Tell me in the comments where you're watching from, what city, what state, what country, what shire, what burg, where in the world are you at? At the end of this video, I'm going to be answering some questions from you. And so if you have a friend or a family member who has been wanting to ask me a question or any of the anybody in the low carb space a question, please share this video with them on Facebook and YouTube. You can you can share this video all over the place. You can invite people to join on Facebook. You can start a watch party on Instagram. You can share this as well. Tell me where you're at in the world. We've got St. Paul, Minnesota. We've got Pennsylvania. We've got Denmark, Nova Scotia. All right. Romania. Excellent. I tried to go earlier this morning so that uh, our friends across the ocean might not be in bed yet or might already be up and, and have had their first cup of coffee so that they can enjoy this and um, ask questions. As always, you are welcome to share this video. That's how you help me reach new people, people who have never heard this message before, people who desperately need to hear the low carb message. This is how you help me is by sharing this video. And that's how you help them is by sharing this video. Uh, if even if you don't agree with me, you have about the low carb concept about a proper human diet concept. You have to agree that whatever we're doing in modern society ain't working. Right. I mean, there's little little doubt about that. We have epidemics of obesity, type two diabetes, fatty liver, chronic inflammatory diseases, chronic autoimmune conditions at levels that we've never had them before in human history. So obviously there is something wrong with our food. And part of the main reason that I do these videos is to, to try to help bring health for you in an unhealthy world. So if you have a friend or loved one who needs some health improvement, who needs some health optimization, then please share this video with them. We got Nebraska, Nevada, <coughs> Plant City, Florida. I've been there before. Ohio, London, and the UK. Excellent, excellent guys. Okay. So the first thing that I want to uh, touch on is the personal fat threshold. And because it, the, you hear all the time on social media, you hear the, the Asian argument and the Indian argument and the vegan argument. Hey, there are people in Asia who eat very high carbohydrate diets, and eat very little meat, and they're very skinny and very healthy. Right. You hear this. You hear this all the time. You see this posted. And it seems like it's a compelling argument because they are. You look you look at video. From, from China or Japan or from the, the Indian subcontinent. And yeah, they, are, they look very slender. And you're like, well, maybe Dr. Berry's wrong. All these people eat rice and, and tubers all the time, but they're still very slender. And in our, in our mind, obesity is obviously such a health problem that we've come to equate being slender with being metabolically healthy. And that's just not the case. And I'm going to tell you in a second how, how you can tease this out. Because there are many slender people out there in the world, all over the world, who are metabolically unhealthy. They, they feel pretty good each most days. They look good in the mirror. They look good in their clothes when they go out for a walk on the street. But yet they're already suffering from the early stages of metabolic syndrome. They're already doing damage to all the tiny arteries in their body but they don't know it. 
And that's a problem. That's a huge problem. And these people also mislead many doctors into thinking, well, low carb, obviously there's nothing to that. Or everybody in China would be fat. Everybody in Japan would be chat, uh, fat. Everybody in South Korea would be fat. Here's how you can tell the difference. And any healthcare providers out there, get ready to copy this down because this is very important. For uh, years, I did not know this information. And so I was as blind as you are to metabolic disease. If someone walked into my office and they were obviously morbidly obese and, you know, I checked a fasting blood sugar and it was 220, obviously they are morbidly obese and type 2 diabetic. That's that's an easy one. But there were many, many slender patients who escaped my notice because back then, <clears throat> 15 years ago, back in 2000, 2001, 2002, I had no idea the power of two simple tests. And so if you have a very slender person come in, they say they feel great, no problems, then you're going to check a very limited set of lab work for their annual uh, checkup, if you check any labs at all. But I would encourage every healthcare provider out there to start checking a, a hemoglobin A1C, even if your patient is slender, even if your patient has a normal fasting blood sugar, because... I promise you what you're going to start to discover is that many of your patients are pre-diabetic. They're going to have a hemoglobin A1C above 5.6 and somewhere below 6.5. And they're going to have no idea that they are pre-diabetic. Now, we know from the medical literature that even in pre-diabetes, there is damage being done to the end organs, to the tiny arterioles. This is this is proven in, in, in a two or three studies so far if not more. And so you are doing a huge disservice to your pre-diabetic patient if first you don't diagnose them. And secondly, you don't start to counsel them about their, their high carbohydrate folly. So that's the first test is the hemoglobin A1C. Even in patients who are not diabetic, even in patients you don't even suspect diabetes, they don't look like a diabetic, they need a hemoglobin A1C. Number two is a C peptide. And this is a proxy marker for insulin production in the human body. For every uh, every one insulin molecule that's produced, there's also a C-peptide molecule that are produced exactly at the same time. Insulin varies greatly in the blood, and so the only way you can reliably check insulin is a fasting insulin. But if you, even if you have a patient come in at 4.30 p.m., you can check a C-peptide because uh, fasting is not required to get a, a usable number from a C-peptide test. Now, this information is so unknown that many people in other countries, their doctors have never heard of a C-peptide test and they they refuse to order it. They're like, no, the, the, you know, the healthcare powers that be won't even let me order that test. And so that that's a huge problem. So what a back to the, to the Asian and Indian problem. How is it possible that these people are so slender, yet they're, they're, they have metabolic disease from eating a high-carbohydrate diet? First and foremost, they have, they have a different personal fat threshold from other people with different genetic makeups. And so I, I am Scotch-Irish with a lot of Nordic, and my, my genetic subset, we tend to get obese very readily. And we, my genetics will start, if I'm eating too many carbohydrates, I'll start to get obese even before I developed prediabetes. And in fact, that's what happened. Only after I was uh, obese by, by medical definition and almost morbidly obese, did I start to develop prediabetes in which I did develop prediabetes. And at my heaviest, I weighed 297 pounds. You can do the, the conversion to kilos if you want to. I'm not going to because I don't want to talk about it because that was a sad time in my life. I was very metabolically unhealed. Now, people with, with Asian genetics, Indian genetics, and, and several other genetic uh, subsets, they don't put on peripheral fat like my genetic subset does. And so they will start to develop something we call visceral fat. They have fat inside of their abdominal musculature. They'll start to put fat in their liver. They'll start to put fat in their pancreas, but they will not develop the classic picture of obesity that we see when we look at somebody who's obviously overweight. They just don't, they don't, they don't do that. They have to grossly overeat carbohydrates for decades and, and kind of try to just eat the junkiest high carb processed diet possible to develop 
true obesity like somebody from my genetic subset would. So that's the problem because when you actually start checking A1Cs and C peptides in the Asian population and the Indian population, you find that a majority of adults have prediabetes or type 2 diabetes that just hasn't been diagnosed uh, or they have hyperinsulinemia, which in my uh, estimation is occult prediabetes or early diabetes. The first thing that actually happens to most people is they develop hyperinsulinemia first, and then they'll, they'll start to raise their hemoglobin A1C. Only after the pancreas is maxed out and can't make any more insulin while the patient continues to eat a high-carb diet, that's when the hemoglobin A1C or the, the average blood sugar starts to rise. So that's a big problem, and it, it hides this metabolic disease from us because these people look slender. Uh, it's, it's my theory that the human species is a low-carbohydrate mammal by design. There is no long-term healthy diet that includes a, a high-carbohydrate macronutrient ratio. It just uh, it does not work for human beings. And we see this in other uh, other species in cattle, they have to eat a, a high carbohydrate diet that is full of grasses and, and the cattle themselves, the ruminant animal can actually break down the, the cellulose and grass and digest it. They have bacteria in their multi chamber stomach that breaks this down. They have a multi-step process and eventually what they wind up absorbing is fatty acids that the bacteria have put off. So they're actually eating a high fat diet, but they have to eat a high carbohydrate diet in order to give the bacteria what they need. We see this in uh, felines, in, in all felines in nature, whether it's your house cat that you love and kiss every day or try to kiss, or it's the, a cheetah out in the wild or a tiger or a lion. All of these guys are carnivores. They're obligate carnivores. <laughs> if you take any feline, any, any cat, big or small, and you feed them a diet that's rich in grains and rich in, in plants, they invariably develop obesity, fatty liver, and prediabetes, and then ultimately type 2 diabetes. This is known in the veterinary literature. There's no, there's no argument about that. And I know that, that some of our vegan friends out there, they, they feel bad when their cat kills a mouse or a bird or when they have to buy meat for their cat. And so they're trying to convert their cat to a, a plant-based diet. That's cat abuse. Your cat is an obligate. And that means your cat is obliged to eat meat or they will get sick. That's what that means. So you cannot... You cannot, in good conscience, feed that species a, a plant-based diet. It's, it's, it's feline abuse. So when we come back to the human species, there is a specific range of carbohydrate intake that is optimal for the human species. And when you not only look at the outward appearance of people, but you also check their A1C and their, and their C peptides so that you get a, a, a behind the scenes look at their glucose metabolism and at their insulin metabolism. When you do that, it opens up this whole new world. And no longer do you just look at the patient's body habitus and say, oh, they're obese. Obviously, they're eating too many carbs. You start to uncover a whole new population of people who are hyperinsulinemic, who are prediabetic, and who are undiagnosed type 2 diabetics because many people in the world don't develop peripheral outer obesity like people from my genetic subset do. Next is starvation versus optimization. This is an excellent concept. So back at the, the turn of the, of the, the um, century, well, let's just say back in, in, in the year 1900, in the 19 uh, O's and the 19 teens, in the United States, starvation and undernutrition was a very real problem. It was very real. And when we were trying to fight World War I, when we had recruits coming in that had been recruited, we would have to fail a lot of them because they were just too skinny and undernourished. They couldn't, they couldn't reliably be counted on to be able to fight in battle. And so the U.S. government said, gosh, we got to fatten our people up. And I'm sure they didn't mean fatten them up. I'm sure they meant what they meant to do was to help them develop a normal body size and have normal amounts of body muscle and body fat. 
But what they did, in fact, was they started subsidizing and encouraging farmers to grow grains, corn, wheat, and 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 that fattened the population up, no doubt about it. And but uh, the, the, that starvation that you're fighting, and so that's a different discussion. If if you are fighting starvation or just abject undernutrition, then yeah, eat carbs, eat eat rice, eat potatoes, eat whatever you can get your hands on, so that you don't starve to death. But when we start to consider a different question, which is human optimization and human freedom from chronic disease, then that's a different question. And so at, at that point, the carbohydrates are, are way less important because they don't provide any meaningful nutrition. Does that make sense? And so if you have a population that's starving to death and is grossly undernourished, yeah, feed them grains, feed them tubers, feed them, uh, you know, feed them special K and skim milk because that's going to help them put on weight. There's no doubt about that. As many of you guys out there who have tried to lose weight on the special K breakfast, you know it, it's you, it's not sustainable. If you eat until you're full and eat every time you're hungry, you're going to gain weight on that diet. And, and so that's why that diet's inappropriate for human beings. But we have to understand we're asking two separate questions. So if there's a country out there that's grossly malnourished, undernourished, and grossly just, you know, there's thousands of people starving to death, then I vote we send all the cornflakes and the and the special K and all the skim milk to them because that's going to help them put on weight very, very quickly and keep them from starving to death, which is in that case the goal. But if your goal is not just fighting starvation, but trying to optimize your one human body, trying to reverse chronic disease that you have or that a loved one has, then eating a high carbohydrate diet is not the answer. And so that's an important question that we have to uh, we have to tease out from the bigger questions. Uh, so anytime you eat a high carbohydrate diet, that is going to spike your insulin to unhealthy levels. And this has been shown in multiple research studies. This is basically this is basic human physiology, which many healthcare providers out there have forgotten about. They're so interested in learning about the latest. Uh, FDA approved prescription drugs and learning all the ins and outs of uh, you don't prescribe this drug with that drug and you you watch out if you're using this drug in a patient with this condition. And that is useful knowledge for a, for a health care provider to have. But what a health care provider needs to understand is that nutrition is the foundation of all human health. Without good nutrition, there's not enough pills in the pharmacy to give us optimal health. And that's that's the key here. That's the goal. Most people in this community are not in danger of starving to death. They're in danger of being overfed yet malnourished. And that's a that's a huge epidemic in modern society because we're taught this weird concept that human beings we don't have to listen to our DNA and our genetics. We don't have to worry about where our species came from. We can just eat whatever the hell we want and it's okay. It's not going to, it's not a big deal. You're going to be fine. Your body will somehow magically convert the trash, highly processed junk food that we're sold every day by, by the billion dollar food corporations. Somehow your body can just magically turn that into lean muscle and, and lean body weight and, and you're, you'll just be healthy. We don't know how it works, but we just know humans are magical in that way. Now, uh, the pragmatists and the common sense users out there immediately are going to say, I don't think that's right. I think probably you're you're made of what you eat. You are built of what you eat. And so if you're eating crap, uh, that's probably going to lead to an, an un, unwanted health outcome. And I totally agree with that. So after you've eaten a high carb diet, your insulin spikes. And that that's after just one meal. You got to understand that. Your, your blood sugar, and then I was reading a research study last night where normal people with who did not have prediabetes or type 2 diabetes or type 1 diabetes, when they ate a, a breakfast cereal and skim milk meal, that was the meal they gave them, the majority of these people also had a blood sugar spike that was equivalent to the blood sugar spike that a diabetic would have. But the problem is, is healthcare providers are blind to this because when we have a patient who we whom we consider normal, they're normal, they don't have prediabetes or diabetes, we never check their blood sugar. 
Why would we? They're normal, right? But what these researchers found is that even in these normal people, they have dangerous blood sugar spikes after this cereal and, 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 and fat-free dairy meal that look just like the spike that a type 2 diabetic would have. And so is that is that temporary spike in that normal person, is that causing disease? Is that causing damage? Hell yes, it is. There's no doubt about that. That's causing damage to all the end organs and to all of the tiny arterioles that feed those end organs. There's no doubt about that. But doctors are blind to that, and, and you may be blind to that. You may think, well, I'm not diabetic. Why would I even check my blood sugar one hour after I eat my oatmeal with banana and toast and orange juice? Why would I even do that? Well, I would highly encourage you to do that because human beings are a low-carbohydrate mammal. And when you eat that many carbohydrates in one sitting, your blood sugar, your insulin is definitely going to spike. And you can't check that at home yet. There's not a test, but you can check your blood sugar. And if your blood sugar goes above 126, that's the current cutoff in the United States, then you've got a problem. You are, you are intolerant to that many carbohydrates. And so when we say something like that, I just did it. But when I say you are intolerant to that many carbohydrates, it sounds like there's some, something wrong with you that there's a problem with your physiology, that there's something wrong with you. The way we should say that is anytime you eat too many carbohydrates for the human physiology, you're going to spike your insulin and you're going to spike your blood sugar. It, there's nothing wrong with you. What's the problem lies with the meal that you just ate that had too many carbohydrates? OK, and so anytime you eat a, a chronic high carbohydrate diet, whether you're of my genetics that develop obesity on the outside or whether you're from Asian or Indian descent and you develop obesity on the inside of your belly, underneath your, your belly muscles, in your liver, in your pancreas, in your around your viscera, regardless of which one of those you are, you're still going to develop fatty liver. You're going to start to put unhealthy fatty streaks in your liver. Your liver absolutely hates this and it hampers your liver function. Many, of, many doctors don't know all the functions of the human liver, and it's my contention. We haven't discovered all of the functions of the human liver yet. So why would you want to hamper and, and impair the performance of this very, very, very important organ? I don't want to do that. I think that's very dangerous for long-term health, and I hope that you don't want to do that either. But anytime you eat a chronically high-carbohydrate diet, you're going to develop fatty liver at some point. That's just going to come. Now, a lot of people love to talk about superfoods. Oh, Aussie berry, oh, kale, oh, spinach, um, carrots I've seen. I've seen blueberries put out as a superfood. Um, what have you seen put out as a superfood that when you compare its nutrition facts to, to an actual superfood, you're like, oh, that's, that's not really that super. The biggest ones you hear are, are blueberries and kale and spinach and, and, and weird berries that come from Jamaica or come from somewhere in the world. And, or it's a root that, that, oh my God, look, this root from Australia. It's always something that people can put in a bottle and sell to you, right? But what I would contend is that uh, liver is a superfood. Animal organs are a superfood. Hell, compared to kale, just cheap minced beef or ground beef is a superfood. Even the cheapest beef you can find still has more nutrition in it than, than the, the most organic non-GMO kale you can get your hands on. So people have been misled for decades about these superfoods. And a lot of people eat kale and they hate kale. They're like, I hate this crap, but it's a superfood. I need to eat it for my health. What you really need to be learning to eat is liver is other animal organs. These are the true superfoods. And indeed, you can see evidence in our paleoanthropological research for millennia that human beings have sought out the, the organs of animals, both scavenged animals, at which you usually don't find any organs because the predators know that that's where the nutrition is. And so they'll usually eat the organs first and then start eating the fat and the lean meat. But you've got to include these organs in your diet if you're ever going to hope to optimize your human health and reverse some chronic disease. Now, let's see. What else? Thank you guys for joining me. Um, as always, you can, you can definitely share this video. I'm going to start taking a few questions now 
So if you have a question, uh, type it in the comments and I'm going to start taking some questions. Let's see. Hey, keto teacher mom, how's it going? Let me get up here on Instagram. Let me find a question up here first. Kathy Clark 54 says, calf liver wrapped in bacon, then baked in the oven till the bacon is done. Yeah, uh, Kathy Clark, that's, that is an excellent superfood meal right there. Fatty meat is my superfood, says Don Don Bowman. I agree, that's my superfood as well. All right, here's somebody from Chile. Yeah, here's a great question. Uh, are ancient grains just a gimmick? Now, this is a this is an, a beautiful question. This is an excellent question because even ancient ancient grains are high in carbohydrates, right? They're they're full of starch. So you'll hear people out there say, "Oh, don't eat our modern GMO wheat. You need to eat einkorn wheat or emmer wheat, like the Egyptians ate." Now, so Tina, here's the answer to that. I don't feel that any grain should make up a substantial part of your diet. If you love ancient grains and you want to have a slice of bread every now and then or however you use the grains, <clears throat> that's probably not a big deal. But for any of us to believe that eating a daily ration of any grain, whether it's a modern GMO grain uh, or whether it's an ancient non-GMO grain, they're still too high in carbohydrates. And indeed, we see... Uh, 10 to 15,000 years ago when humans really started making grains a big part of their diet. And that wasn't GMO grains, okay? That was ancient grains, even more ancient than, than, the, than, than emmer wheat or einkorn wheat. They started to have a smaller brain size. They started to have a smaller body. They started to have terrible cavities in their teeth and, and dental abscesses that are life-threatening, could kill them. They started to have poorly developed bones. We can see this in the fossil record. There's no doubt about this. Whereas the hunters before the agricultural revolution, <coughs> thus proving not all revolutions are a good thing, they started to get small and weakly and sickly. And so I don't think there's any healthy grain on the planet to eat daily. Um, I, I think probably the ancient grains, einkorn and emmer wheat are less bad. I think if you can find a non-GMO soybean and ferment it to make some fermented soy product, that's probably less bad than the GMO soy. Uh, if, yeah, I, I think it's less bad. But as you've heard me say before, that don't make it good. And that's what we're looking for is what's good, what's better, what's best for this human body that I inhabit. Uh, another great example is uh, my, my good friend and a, a, a colleague who I respect very, very much, Dr. Michael Eads. He has some excellent lectures on YouTube about the Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians who didn't eat any GMO wheat, wheat or at all. They ate emmer wheat, which is a very ancient strain of wheat. They had terrible teeth and they, were, they ate so much wheat that they were called the bread people by other cultures, because that bread was a part of pretty much every meal, every single day of their life. They had severe heart doc, uh, disease, cardio uh, coronary artery disease that's been documented in hundreds of autopsies and hundreds of uh, scans of, of mummies. And people love to say, well, it was only the very rich that were mummified, so you're getting a false picture. Well, that's actually not true at all. In ancient Egyptian society, the only people that didn't get mummified were prisoners of war, prisoners, and just completely homeless people on the street. That's who didn't get mummified. If you had any family whatsoever, if you had any stand, if you were middle class, lower middle class or above in ancient India, in ancient Egypt, you got mummified to some degree. And so these mummies come from all socioeconomic strata, and they show severe coronary artery blockages and calcification and plaque buildup starting in the 30s, when they were in their 30th, third decade or fourth decade, they were, you know, 31, 32, 33. When you would do a scan on their mummy, they would have severe dental disease. They would have severe coronary artery blocking and placking. They had very brittle bones. They had, they were just, they were just weak, puny little people. 
And they they did make some uh, social and technological revolutions, and that's why they were the predominant empire at that time. It definitely was not because of their diet. Okay, that's very, very important to say. And so, no, I don't think grain is ever a healthy daily choice for human beings. If you'd like some, some, something made of grains as an occasional treat for your birthday or anniversary, that's probably not a big deal because uh, humans at any time in our history, if we were starving, we would eat grains. If we couldn't find any fatty, fatty animals, we would eat grains, of course, because that's better than starving to death. Back to what I was talking about earlier. Excellent question. Thank you for that, Tina. Let's find another question here. Oh, man, they're going by fast. Yeah, again, let me just hit this again for Mimi. Eating whole wheat bread is probably less bad than eating just highly processed white bread. But eating whole wheat bread is not a healthy choice for, for this low carbohydrate mammal. Uh, eating whole wheat, non-GMO, organic bread, that's that, that's less bad than eating the cheap white bread, but it's not good. It's not, it is a, it's a terrible daily choice for human nutrition. It's never going to give you your optimal health. Yeah, great question here. D says, is cod liver sufficient as organ meat? So cod liver comes from the, the codfish and it is the liver of that codfish, and it is absolutely a superfood. I, I love cod liver. It's one of the first livers that I actually enjoyed eating. And as I've progressed on this journey, I now enjoy eating all liver and all organs. And that's an important point to touch on is that your palate, your, your, what you like and, and what you dislike, that changes over time. It, you Many of us feel like that's set in stone. Oh, I don't like liver. That's it. Don't even talk to me about it. That's 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 kind of a childish attitude to have. OK, there was a time in your life when all you liked was breast milk and you didn't want anything else. Should you just still suckle breast milk for the rest of your life? No, you have you've grown up. And as we grow up and mature, we should put away childish behavior. And so if currently you're like, the only thing I like is, is breaded chicken strips and ketchup. Anything else? I don't like it. Well, that that's that is the palate. That's the that's the taste spectrum of a child. And you are no longer a child. If you're watching this, probably you need to grow up and start to eat adult foods. And liver is an adult food. And as soon as you redevelop your, your taste buds and your palate so that you can enjoy liver cooked in a, a thousand different ways, that's when you're going to re realize your true, true health. Now, for many people, uh, you just hate liver currently. And I understand that because I used to be that guy. I used to hate liver. There is a free dr freeze-dried liver supplement uh, that's made by Ancestral Supplements right here. And I've got a link down in the show notes that you can check that out on Facebook and on YouTube. Uh, but I don't want you to just take that for the rest of your life. I want you to take that as you are learning to like liver, as you're learning to actually evolve your palate so that you can eat adult foods that human human adults have eaten for our entirety on this planet. You probably grew up uh, being fed crackers and peanut butter and being fed, you know, uh, baby food that's just nothing but ground up high fructose fruit. And then you, you started eating breakfast cereals and skim milk. And so your palate was never allowed to develop as it should. Most babies, if they're fed right by one year of age, they're going to devour any meat that you put in front of them. And that's because their, their genetics, their hardwiring knows that that's real nutrition. Only if you stunt a baby's palate development by just feeding them ground up fruits and ground up peas and crackers, are they not going to be able to hear that calling from deep inside their genetics saying, yes, eat that meat. That's good for you. you that'll help you grow quickly and, and grow successfully. So, yeah, cod liver is great. Chick, any of the liver of any animal is going to be great. Now, I have to caution you to avoid avoid polar bear liver and puffer fish liver because these things, there has been at least anecdotal reports, if not a written up case report, of someone getting vitamin A toxicity from eating that liver. Those are special, hard to find livers. But when, when it comes to talking about cod liver, chicken liver, beef liver, pork liver, sheep, goose, there is, there is not a single documented case report of anybody ever developing hypervitaminosis A from eating that liver 
No one's ever documented that. It's never happened as far as we can tell. So if you want to eat liver every day, I think it's 100% safe and appropriate to do that. If you want to have liver twice a week, I think that's adequate and that's going to get you by. But until you can learn to love liver, get the freeze-dried liver supplement and take that so that you know you're getting all of, at least some of the amazing superfood nutrition in liver uh, until you learn to like it. But I never want you to use this as a crutch. I want you to keep trying liver different ways. Order some cod liver. You might be surprised at how, how you like that. You can use it a thousand different ways to get the nutrition without just eating the raw cod liver out of the can. Thank you for that question. That was a good one. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm, 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 well, where'd you go? There we go. Uh, Rahab says, I'm looking forward to your next book. I'm working on it now. Uh, I am, um, uh, pretty busy and also have ADD. So some days not much work gets done on it, but I definitely, every time I make one of these videos that helps me to write another chapter or write another paragraph in that book, because it helps me think of ways to say things that help people understand. Um, that was a good question. Where did that go? Yeah. Hero says, what about sprouted grains? Cause we're told that if, if you sprout the grain, then it's totally okay. So there's two things that we're talking about here, Eero. Plants, first of all, they don't want you to eat their seeds because their seeds are their unborn, unborn babies. That's how they're going to continue their genetic line. And so they actually put active toxic chemicals in their seeds in order to prevent herbivores, that's anything that eats a plant, from eating their seeds. And indeed, some seeds will kill you to kill you in minutes. Other seeds will, will cause you not to be able to absorb certain minerals or certain vitamins or will make cause chronic inflammation. And so a lot of people found that if you sprout grains, it, it, they're less inflammatory and they're less harmful to the human system. And I think that's 100% correct. But again, we have to go back to our bad and good scale. Just because something is less bad doesn't make it good. Right. And so I think 100 percent sprouted grains are less inflammatory and less full of chemical toxins, because once the seed sprouts, now it's a plant. And usually the toxins stored in there, they just they dissipate. So if you're going to eat grains, I would definitely eat a, a non GMO organic sprouted grain like Ezekiel bread. But do I think that's good for da eating daily? No, of course not. It's still just as high in carbohydrates as it was before. It's just less bad now. And so does that, I hope you guys are getting that concept because people found out, oh, if you sprout the grain, then it's not as inflammatory. They're like, oh, therefore it's good. No, 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 no. That does not make it good. You still have to look at the macronutrients. You still have to look at the vitamins and minerals contained because vitamins and minerals are super important. And many of the soils in our, in, uh, that we farm have been severely depleted of minerals. Sprouting that grain is not going to make more minerals magically appear, right? It's just going to be get rid of a lot of the chemical toxins that the plant's trying to protect its seed with. So I would never eat sprouted grains on a daily basis. And I'll tell you, I used to, I used to eat sprouted grains. That was the only grain I would touch. I would only eat Ezekiel bread because at that time, I thought it was good. Now I know it was just less bad. That's back when I when I was very early in this health and optimization journey, and I was paleo. And I thought, well, I'm not going to eat grains, but the sprouted grain, that sounds better. That sounds right. And there's actually scripture in the Christian uh, Old Testament describing how to make this. And I was like, well, that's very, you know, that's pretty darn old. That's a few thousand years ago. So that must be better. But now looking at this circumspectly, you realize, no, emmer wheat from, from uh, Egypt, it still caused plaque buildup in the coronary arteries. It still caused cavities. It still caused all, you know, their bones not to develop strongly and appropriately. Sprouted grains are in the same boat as emmer wheat. It's less bad, but that does not make it good. Thank you for that question. Let's find a few more good questions. If you, if I haven't got to your question, retype it in the comments and because they're scrolling by very, yeah, okay. So here's, here's a question that combines bread and liver. Can you bread the liver and then saute it or fry it? Depends on what you're breading it with. Uh, we do bread our livers, but we use pork panko, which is also an animal 
product, right? Never would I bread the liver with wheat or cornmeal because then you're getting right back to the inflammatory high carbohydrate diet that we're trying to get away from. But uh, some people will use a combination of pork panko and almond flour, which is less bad than wheat flour, uh, but still not great. But I think it's less bad. They'll use a combination of those two and bread their liver and then saute or fry them. And it's delicious and it's very good. Uh, but I would never bread my liver if I were going to saute or fry it with wheat or corn or soybean or oats or any other grain because you're going to you're still getting the superfood nutrition from the liver, but you're then causing inflammation from the from the wheat or the corn. Got it? And that's a problem. And you're up in your carbohydrate intake. Pork rind panko, pranko. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, if you if somebody mentioned cricket flour. Huh? Now that sounds gross to me currently, but but I probably need to expand my palate some more. Cricket flour would be perfect for breading uh, liver in or breading anything in. Cricket, I mean, that is, I, human beings used to eat copious amounts of insects. Uh, it's spoken about in, in the Christian scripture that, you know, you can eat those and it's totally fine. Many cultures uh, eat a large percentage of their diet is, is insects. Now, I currently don't, I don't do that. Do I think it's ancestrally appropriate? Absolutely. Do I think it's as good uh, if you're eating an insect-based diet versus a ruminant diet? No, I think it's less good than a if you're eating ruminants. But it's I think eating a, a, an insect-based insect diet is probably far, far superior to eating a plant-based diet. But I'm just not into that yet. But if anybody wants to send me some cricket flour, I'll definitely try it out. I'll bread my chicken liver and see how it tastes. Absolutely. Would you would you eat cricket flour? Because I mean, I'm a, I would try cricket flour. Uh, I probably just couldn't right now. I'm, I would have to really get my courage up to just get a bag of roasted crickets and start crunching them like popcorn or meat skins. But I would I would try cricket flour. Would you try that currently? I don't know if people would try that or not. Let's see. Rock People says, when gallbladder goes wrong, what can be eaten? So if you have a bad gallbladder or if you have no gallbladder at all, you should still eat the proper human diet, which is a very low carbohydrate diet that doesn't have any sugar added or natural, that doesn't have any grains at all, that doesn't have any vegetable oils at all, and that has a large component of fatty meat, whether that's seafood, ruminant, poultry, it doesn't matter. That is the proper human diet, and when you eat that diet, it's going to help all of your organs. And there's a there's a way of thinking out there, and doctors fall prey to this all the time. Oh, you don't have a gallbladder. Oh, you don't have a thyroid. Oh, you've had a gastro bypass. So you can't eat that. You can't eat keto or carnivore, ketovore, low carb. You can't do that. But that's the proper human diet. And when you think of it in that context, when you use that paradigm, it's like, well, if you have your gallbladder taken out, are you no longer human? No, you're still human, right? And you should still eat the proper human diet. Uh, but you might have to modify your proper human diet or you might have to take some bile acids uh, or, or ox bile supplement. You might have to break your meals up into three smaller meals a day instead of one big meal a day. But it, it, regardless of what surgical procedure you've had done on your body, you're still a human being and you should eat the proper human diet. Thank you for that question. <coughs> Hey, thanks for the super sticker, Keto for Real Life People. It's good to see you, lady. Uh, Mary Alice Pendergast says, thank you for helping save my life. Well, Mary, that's that's what doctors are supposed to do. We are supposed to save lives and we're supposed to improve lives. And if I'm not doing that, then I'm not a very good doctor. So I'm going to try to always continue to do that through videos, through, through writing books, through uh, seeing patients. Let's see. Let me find another um, crypto color lights tech says, what is good carbs? So definitely you want any carbohydrates you do eat to be very uninflammatory. And so 
I would say you would never eat grains as your carbohydrates. I would say that you never eat the seeds of any plant as your carbohydrates. Uh, and some people, this includes nuts because they, even if they're eating tree nuts, they still notice inflammation in your body. Some people seem to be able to eat tree nuts and do okay. Some people cannot. And the reason I say tree nuts is because a lot of people think that peanuts are nuts, but they're not. They're actually goober peas. They're a legume that grows under the ground. So if you're eating peanuts thinking that they're real nuts, they ain't, and they're very starchy, and they're usually covered with mold, and I would avoid eating peanuts. Uh, but good carbs are going to be carbohydrates that don't cause inflammation and that you eat in a low enough quantity that you're not spiking your insulin and spiking your blood sugar. And and so I, I actually agree with my good friend, Dr. Paul Saladino, that maybe it's fruits. Maybe fruit is the only carbohydrates we should eat. And I think this is absolutely true for some people who are very sensitive to the, the chemical toxins that plants put in their leaves. And so there may be some of you watching who, if you eat 20 total grams a day of, of kale and spinach and beet leaves, you're just full of inflammation. Even though you're eating a low carb diet, you're still eating and the, the carbs you're eating are inflammatory. And so Paul's argument about this, and I tend to agree, is that plants want you to eat their fruit because that's how they that's how they propagate their species. But I still think you need to take keep your carbohydrate intake under 20 total grams a day for most people. And so if you want your 20 total grams today to be, uh, you know, peaches or apples or whatever, I think that's probably fine. I don't personally do that because I feel better when I eat as close to zero carbohydrate intake as possible. But if you can tolerate 20 or 30 or 50 total grams of carbs a day, probably fruit is the less, less inflammatory choice. Um, most modern fruit is, is has been bred to be very tasty, very sweet, and they didn't breed for nutrient density. So I just was, I'm listening to an excellent book now, uh, about anthropology. And there's, he just said that, you know, 200 years ago, you could get the vitamins from one orange and to, in, from today's oranges, you'd have to eat eight oranges to get the same nutrient density. Now you're going to get a ton of calories and a ton of carbohydrates and a ton of fructose from your eight modern oranges, but you're not going to get the nutrient density that you would have gotten even 200 years ago. And that that's, that's a problem I have with fruit is it's been selectively bred to be big and sweet and tasty and easy to eat and uniform in size. But no one ever thought, you know, we really should breed our fruit so that it's very nutritious. Nobody ever thought to do that because you, when you're looking at a, an orange in the grocery store, in the supermarket, you can't really tell by looking at it, is it nutrient dense or is it nutrient void? So the, the, the breeders were looking for traits they could sell at the market. You want a big, beautiful, colorful orange that, that has tiny seeds or no seeds at all. You want it to be full of sweet juice. But nobody ever thought, are we making it less nutrient dense? And almost without exception, when you look at in horticulture and in, in plant science, they bred for appearance. They bred for size. They bred for taste. But no one thought to breed for nutrient density. And, and that's, that's a problem. So however you get your carbs, I think you should keep your carbohydrate intake very, very low. And you sh it should be a carbohydrate that is not inflammatory, that doesn't lead to chronic disease. Excellent question. Let's see, we've got time for one or two more. If I haven't gotten to yours, retype it and I'll try to get it. Okay, Dennis, what's Dennis? I don't know, it's not Dennis. Here's Dennis. Dennis says, what do you think about high linoleic acid meat like chicken and pork? Should we avoid them? Uh, this is a valid question. Now, first of all, I would take I would take exception with how you worded this. Chicken and pork are not high linoleic acid meats. They do have linoleic acid. They have more linoleic acid uh, if they're if they're uh, CAFO raised, if so, if, if the chickens are raised in a in a you know like a chicken house feedlot situation, if the pork is raised in, in a feedlot and just fed grains, they're going to have a higher linoleic acid con content. There's no doubt about that. But actually, high linoleic foods are uh, vegetable oils, and that's where, in fact, the majority of people in population they get 
the majority of their linoleic acid from vegetable oils. So I, I, I for the for the average person in modern society, eating pork and chicken is a much better option than eating any of the high carbohydrate foods. But yes, I absolutely do think, and we when we start to split hairs like this, we start to create factions in the proper human diet family. And I don't like to do that. So let me be very clear about this. Pastured chicken is going to be lower in linoleic acid, 100%. Pastured pork is going to be lower in linoleic acid. There's no doubt about that. And I think it is healthier for us to eat. But there are many of us who are stuck in a, situ a social situation where all we can afford is supermarket pork and chicken because they're, they're two of the cheapest meats. And what I don't want to happen is for those people to just say, well, I can't afford grass-fed, grass-finished beef, so, or it's not available here, so I'm just screwed. I can't do, I can't do low-carb keto carnivore. I don't think that's true at all. I think if you're eating the cheapest chicken or pork you can find, that's still 100 times better for you than eating the high-carbohydrate junk that the billion-dollar food corporations try to sell you. But if you can afford pastured chicken and pastured pork and grass-fed, grass-finished beef, it does have a lower linoleic acid uh, content. It does have a better omega-3 to omega-6 fatty acid ratio. And you should eat that if you can afford that. And uh, so, but I don't want people to be discouraged if they can't afford that. That's why I, I, I break that apart like that. Thank you. Okay. Barb's, uh, no, I missed Barb. Oh, there's Barb. Yeah. Is low-fat cottage cheese and Greek yogurt okay? Well, I mean, it's it's less bad than eating, you know, Kellogg Special K or Wheaties or uh, Lucky Charms. But why why would you want to get low-fat cottage cheese? Why wouldn't you want to get full-fat cottage cheese? Why wouldn't you want to get full-fat Greek yogurt? Uh, even for me, uh, full-fat cottage cheese and, and Greek yogurt are not fatty enough for me. They, they still have too many carbohydrates for me. But low-fat cottage cheese is, is complete junk food because all of the, the healthy, nutritious fats been taken out. And you only have protein and car carbohydrates to replace that with. And indeed, most low-fat or fat-free cottage cheese and Greek yogurt, they're going to add sugar to that because it just tastes like crap without the fat. So they have to add some flavor back, and they do that by adding a fruit flavor, which is just sugar, uh, or they add just pure sugar. Or add honey, which is also pure sugar. Uh, so don't eat low-fat anything. If it says low-fat on the package or fat-free or skim, leave it in the supermarket. Because every time you buy that, you're voting with your dollars. You're telling your supermarket manager, hey, I like that low-fat crap. Buy more of that and give me more low-fat options. But when you don't buy low-fat anything or skim anything, you're voting with your dollars. You're telling your local supermarket manager, these people don't want low fat. We're going to stop having 50 different varieties of low fat, skim, everything. We're going to start stocking full fat because that's what people want. That needs to happen. And that's one of the ways that you can vote with your dollars. So Barb, don't get the low fat anything. Get full fat. If you love cottage cheese and it doesn't seem to bother you, get full fat. Same goes for Greek yogurt, regular yogurt. Same goes for kefir. Same goes for any dairy product. Never buy low fat or skim or reduce fat. Don't ever buy that. You're sending an unhealthy message to the producers and to the sellers, but you're also harming your own health. Great question. Yeah, the chat does go fast, doesn't it, Tim? I'm telling you, and I'm the one over here trying to pick out a pick out a question. Let's see. <laughs> I love it. Dawn says her grandmother used to call skim milk bucket washings. And that's 100 percent accurate. Farmers back in the in the teens and 20s used to nobody wanted skim milk. And so when they what you're left when you take all the fat out of milk is skim milk. And so back in the teens and 20s, everybody knew butter was good for you and everybody loved to eat lots of butter. And so there was there was a, they would take the butter out of the milk and you're left with skim milk. Nobody wanted to buy that crap. So they fed it to the hogs and they found that it really helped fatten the hogs up if they gave them a combination of skim milk, which is fat free milk and grains. The hogs got really fat really quickly. So, yeah, if you want to get fat really quickly as a mammal, then eat lots of skim dairy with mixed with grains and that will fatten you up, my friend. I promise. All right. Let's do one more question here. Man, they're going, Lord. 
Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, JCAD just gave me 2,000 somethings. I don't know what, what's a W with two lines through it? That's some kind of currency. He says, is celery juice okay for psoriasis? Um, celery juice is not going to help your psoriasis whatsoever. I've got uh, one, if not two, YouTube videos about what you can do to actually improve your psoriasis, and celery juice ain't in the video. Um, I know that there's a very popular guy out there who talks about celery juice and the magic of it and how it's just the perfect thing for the human being to ingest. Uh, celery juice is, there's nothing magic about it. I'm sorry. If you, if you believe that currently you've been misled, there's nothing magic about celery juice. Celery juice, celery in and of itself is just a nutrient void, crunchy thing. When you get the juice out of it, it, it's just water and it does have a few vitamins and minerals, whatever, whatever the soil, soil had that the celery grew in. But I mean, people call celery juice a superfood and this is ridiculous. I mean, compare two ounces of beef liver, all the vitamins and minerals contained in it, all the fatty acids and amino acids and put that up against celery juice. Celery juice is devoid of nutrition. There's nothing magical in celery juice. It's just celery juice. So I doubt seriously that's going to help your psoriasis. Maybe rubbing it on your psoriasis might help the itching a little, but in, but drinking the celery juice, no, it's not going to help a bit. Thanks for that question in the, in the super chat for 2000, whatever that W is. I don't know what that is. Anybody know what that is? What's a W currency? I don't know. Oh, what book am I reading right now? Oh gosh, I can't remember the name of it. Let me just look here and see. The book I'm reading right now is called African Genesis. <clears throat> it's not a very popular book, but it's an uh, investigation into animal origins and the nature of man. And uh, that's what I'm reading currently. I'll try to I'll look it up and I'll put a link in the show notes on YouTube and on Facebook. All right, guys, that's all I got time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate it. Uh, I'll see you next time.